This is AutoLine After Hours with Gary Vaslash and John McElroy, episode 555 for April 29th, 2021. Arrival in America, innovative product, innovative process. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, John is not here today, so as a result of that, I had to bring in two of the smartest guys I know in the auto industry to help me out with today's show. So I'd like to bring in Mike Austin from Hemmings and also Joe White from Reuters. So thank you guys. Too kind. So, all right. So as, as you guys know that this is, this is the portion of the show where I usually try to uh, trick or, or fool John into not being able to answer a question about something that happened in automotive history. So, you know, given the fact that I, I have, you know, especially a guy who writes for Hemmings, I could not resist the possibility of doing this one. So now, now Mike, you can come up with the answer for this or Joe can answer this. In 2004, something happened very significant in the auto industry on this day. I'll make it even. I'll make it even easier. And it happened in Lansing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that. Um, I can wait to see if Joe comes back. I was gonna say I, I am probably the, you know, in terms of knowledge of history at Hemmings, I'm, I'm, I'm in the most current history. But you did 2004, so I don't have an excuse. But the, the hint <laughs> got it for me. Um, uh, Joe, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm I, I technical glitch. I missed the I missed the question. All right. Some, something happened today in 2004 in Lansing, Michigan. Oh, boy. 2004. Last Oldsmobile? I, I was just going to say the end of Oldsmobile. Maybe it's the last production one? Last production Oldsmobile? The end of Oldsmobile. Yeah, it was in Lillero. Oh. And, and what I didn't realize that at the time, Oldsmobile was the third most historic brand in the industry. It was Daimler, Peugeot, and, and Oldsmobile. Yeah, it was like 100 years old or maybe a little bit more, right? 106. So um, there you go. So, so Mike, do you think that Olero would be worth much now? Um, no, but there is a lot of, there is a lot of Oldsmobile interest. You know, like uh, this was one thing I learned recently. You know, the Grand Prix was the best-selling car in America in like 1976. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 442 is, is still a legend. So there's, there's a lot of great blues and rock and roll songs about Oldsmobiles. Every once in a while, one pops up. Uh, yeah, they, they, it, it was definitely, the brand was a thing for a, for a long while. I, I mean, I like to think of, uh, uh, you know, John Snyder, who was like the father of the 442 and the Tornado. Like, he was kind of like John DeLorean without the Flash. Like, um, you know, more of the guy that got down to business instead of flying to L.A. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about a lot of stuff like that afterwards, but um, for now, I want to bring in our special guest. Now, you know, we, we've had many special guests, but um, here is, is, a, is a guy who is with a company which is, is absolutely un unique in the industry, I think. Um, Mike Abelson is the CEO of a company called Arrival Automotive. So, so Mike, thank you for joining us. And um, so... Since I'm sure many of our, our viewers are not familiar with the company, give us, give us a brief thumbnail about what you're all about. I will. I'm very pleased to be here, Gary. Thanks for having me. So sure. Arrival is a company that uh, actually is a little over six years old. We're about uh, a little under 2,000 employees. Um, recently listed on the NASDAQ as a public company, and our focus is uh, manufacturing commercial electric vehicles as well as doing a lot of work on software, both for the vehicles and for the surrounding systems um, on those commercial vehicles. And we're using some very unique approaches to do that, which I'm sure we'll talk about some more. Sure. So, so it's a UK-based company, and um, it's, it's at this point all about EVs. 
and all about commercial vehicles? Yeah, it's um, so it is based in the UK, in London. And I would tell you, it's fascinating for me as a veteran of the auto industry, uh, being part of the company because it's composed of folks from a lot of different industries. The founder is actually from the smartphone and software industries. Uh, we have a lot of folks um, out of consumer electronics. Uh, over half the engineers at the company are software engineers. So a, a very different mix of people and backgrounds than what I think you find in a traditional OEM. And um, as you said, Gary, we're focused on commercial electric vehicles. We've announced uh, three products. Two of them are relatively close to production. We have an electric bus and an electric blast mile delivery van. That delivery van, we have two different platforms uh, with two different payloads uh, associated with them. So, Gary, can I, can I oh, please, please. throw a question? Yeah, I finally got back in. Hi, Mike. Um, so really interesting company. I guess I want to take a step or two back and ask you to talk about the market that you're in. Because at one level, um, your market is completely nascent, right? It's 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 barely it barely exists. On an, at another level, and you, you know your company has put this in your various SEC forms, you've already got a lot of competition. It's a pretty crowded field. Um, how do you see that shaking out, and what's going to determine? I mean, when as you sit and say, well, how are we going to win? What do you say as the answer to that? How how do you win uh, when you're literally at the at the first foot and a half of a of a race? So let me talk about the market first, Joe, um, because it is very different from the retail automotive market. The uh, large commercial fleet operators, um, we actually think they're going to flip to electric vehicles more quickly than the retail market will. And, and that'll happen for a few reasons. Um, one, the lower total cost of operation of the electric vehicles is very appealing to people that have to run these large commercial fleets. Um, secondly, I mean, we talk about range anxiety with uh, electric vehicles. These large commercial fleets, they're very sophisticated. They know exactly how many miles their vehicles have to cover every day. So they don't have range anxiety. They have range requirements. They tell you what range the vehicles have to cover every day, and you just have to design to get that done. And then finally, I would say the whole issue of charging infrastructure um, you know, these large fleets are typically parked at a depot overnight uh, right. where the vehicles can be charged. And it's a much simpler problem to install charging infrastructure at this one geographic location at the depot than trying to get it spread all over the public space, you know, which we're working towards um, to support retail vehicles. But I think it'll take a lot longer. So um, honestly, what we find as we talk to these uh, large commercial fleet operators is they're crying out for more electric vehicle choices and products. And then, so to circle back around to your point, Joe, on what will it take to win? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we've done by focusing on commercial vehicles is really design the vehicle from the ground up for those uh, commercial fleet operators. And of course, as I mentioned, one of their primary metrics is total cost of operation. And that includes both purchase price and the ongoing cost to operate the vehicles. We have spent a lot of time working on reducing the uh, cost of the vehicle, the overall cost of the vehicle. You know, I would say typically in the industry, when we talk about the cost of electric vehicles, everybody focuses in on battery costs. And, you know, that's understandable since they are a large percentage of the total vehicle. But when you look at it and you know that all the OEMs are basically using cells from the same handful of cell suppliers, you're not going to build a competitive advantage on cell cost. It's all the other parts of the vehicle that you've really got to attack. And, and that's what we've been doing at Arrival. And, and I would say that cost focus for us is not just on the vehicle itself, but also the method of production. So we've been working on a lower cost. At the same time, we're doing best in class vehicles. Um, we spend a lot of time around cargo efficiency. Um, I mentioned all the different um, backgrounds that uh, people in the company come from. One of the places we spend a lot of time is the whole HMI, the human machine interface. Um, when you look at the, you know, what the driver environment is in commercial vehicles today, it's behind where retail vehicles are, much less behind what 
we can really do if we apply all the the latest learnings from the smartphone industry and the laptop industry and all the consumer electronics. So um, we we think we're going we will deliver a best in class product with a best in class driver experience at a lower lower total cost of operation. And we think with commercial fleet operators that'll be a winning combination. Okay. Mike Austin. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, getting to an autonomous car and building cars um, involves a lot of other uh, expertise and technology. And so how much, you know, when you look at, at scale or volume or, or going back to, you know, how do you win? What, how much of that is, you know, building vehicles long term and how much of that is, is licensing or partnering some of the technology as it might move into other applications? So we've been focused on developing a lot of our own technology. As I mentioned before, the company is six years old. And um, to be perfectly honest, we were in stealth for about the first four of those years, just working on all the technology that we wanted to bring to bear. Um, we very much have this uh, approach of designing a set of common components that we can use across our portfolio. So if I take, for instance, our battery module, we use exactly the same battery module in the transit bus as we do in the last mile delivery vans as we will in a future small vehicle platform. Uh, the traction motors are shared between the bus and the delivery vans. And so, um, you know, people often ask, how do you get scale as a startup with, with your own components? And the answer is you use those components across your whole portfolio. Um, so where we are using tier one suppliers or where um, safety systems are involved, things like airbags, seat belts, uh, braking systems, steering systems, you know, areas of the vehicle where you, you really want to have a very well validated solution. But um, in the high voltage system and the low voltage system, uh, electrical systems in the vehicle, we're developing uh, our own components. On the high voltage side, it's around lowering cost, as I spoke to earlier. On the low voltage side, it's um, being able to get access to all the data in the vehicle. Um, most vehicles today, the electrical system is assembled from a whole variety of tier one components. And it's sometimes hard to see all the data across all those components. We've designed those components in-house to give us access to everything that's going on in the vehicle, and we think in the commercial vehicle space using this data uh, both to look at how the vehicles are operating but also to start doing predictive um, predictive maintenance is another advantage we'll have over time so um, i would say mike uh, we are leveraging partners on the technology side less than most other oems mike how important was it that ups not only invested in your company but purchased 10,000 vehicles? Um, it's, um, well, it was great. Uh, UPS, we've been working for, or we've been working with UPS for a number of years. They've been fabulous partners. And, um, you know, there've been um, advantages on both sides. We, with our approach to manufacturing the vehicles, we can design a vehicle to their requirements. Um, we am, we employ relatively low cost tooling technologies so we can afford to you know with a fleet the size of ups and an order the size of uh, what we're discussing um, we're willing to do a vehicle that really matches exactly what they need um, and so i think the um you know both the order and the um, investment um, are a huge indicator of how much confidence UPS has in the work we've been doing and what we will deliver to the market. So um, they've been just fantastic partners um, with us here over the last several years. Mike, can I, I just want to follow up on that. I mean, it seems like UPS and the, and the, and the big e-commerce delivery fleets um, are, really, are really driving the market that you're in. Broadly, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's important. You know, it's very important to, to arrival, but it seems like they are critical to this whole thing. That that if if you're going to electrify this this segment, th those companies are it. Or or do you see sort of smaller fleets? You know, a little more like tradespeople and people like that getting into this. I'm just sort of wondering how you see this market evolving near term. 
So I think, Joe, to your point, you'll see it in phases. And, and right now, the large commercial fleet operators are leading the way. And you'll find that all of these companies, UPX and FedEx and Amazon and the others, they all have ESG goals they've already published with um, all right. specific goals on electrifying their fleet. So they're going to move very aggressively. And I think over time, you'll see the small and medium fleets uh, move into electric vehicles for all the same reasons the large fleets will. Mm -hmm. um, it's just uh, in the large fleets, obviously, you've got very sophisticated operations. They can afford to do a lot of analysis and crunch the numbers. And, um, and so they're already convinced that electric vehicles are the answer. I think you'll see more and more fleet operators come to the same conclusion here over the next few years. Okay, just a quick follow, and then I'll turn it over to my 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 peers here on the panel. So I mean, it does seem like you know UPS seems to have put a, put bets on a bunch of different companies, including yours. Um, but do you think that the fleet that these the major fleets and you named the three that I can think of, and I guess DHL in Europe would be a, a fourth. Do you think that they're going to do the same thing, spread bets, or is you know is Amazon basically in Rivian's camp, and that's it? They're a Rivian company and, you know, UPS will be somebody else's company and FedEx and DHL, you know, pick one partner. I mean, do you think that's what's happening here? And if you miss out, you miss out. So um, honestly, I think if you look at it today, you know, look at the fleets they have, they don't typically go with one OEM for their entire fleet. Um, there are a variety of commercial reasons why I think they'll want to have um, more than one, but probably no more than a handful of OEMs that are supplying electric vehicles to them. And, and that's what I, obviously, I don't have any inside information on any of these companies, but as we think about the business at Arrival, that's what we expect that uh, all these large commercial fleet operators will be doing. How does, um, how do the electric vehicles compare to an internal combustion one in terms of overall life? You know, I mean, your, your operating costs are obviously lower the wear parts are different, but it, you know, when, when these companies are looking at buying vehicles, part of that calculus is when are we going to replace them? And, and how is, is that, how's that different for an EV? Well, I think, um, you know, the primary question there, Mike, is how long will the battery pack last? And what's, um, what's interesting with electric vehicles, I think, you know, with an ICE engine, typically people focus on mileage and time how many years has it been around and how many miles has it covered? And it's a little more complicated than that with batteries. You uh, have to look at things like um, what's the charging uh, regimen been? Um, what is the energy throughput of the batteries? It's, it's all stuff that we've been doing a lot of modeling on so we can have uh, conversations with our customers, knowing what their use case is and talk to them about what size battery they need to hit a certain life. Um, not surprisingly, if you've got a given route um, and you size the batteries so that you can only do that route, so you're fully charging and discharging the battery every day, that's harder on the battery than if you get a bigger battery and you're using less of the total capacity of the battery every day. So there are some trade-offs here to be made as uh, we work with customers on what is the lowest total cost of operation. Okay, I have a uh, question here from one of our viewers, uh, Raymond Exum, I believe his name is. Um, what is the biggest edge of having software engineers focused on the development of your vehicles versus just mainly mechanical engineers? And um, now I'm not so sure that you guys are into autonomy, but would this provide an edge in, in that area? Should that be where you're going to be pursuing? Yeah, I think... Um it's a good question, and I probably should have expanded on it when I touched on it earlier. There are a few things. Um, one are the systems in the vehicle. So uh, as I talked about, you know, we do our interface through a screen. Um, we use some very sophisticated software on the vehicle to help um, minimize the cost of operation. Um, and then we design a variety of backend systems that work with the data that we pull off the vehicle to again, help the customers uh, minimize their total cost of operation. What you're seeing on the screen is actually some shots of uh, our factories, which we call micro factories. We can talk some more about that. It's a very different uh, method of manufacturing vehicles. And here again, the software is important. Um, 
you know, we use a variety of standard robotic arms that we buy from suppliers, but we control them with very sophisticated software that we develop internally. All right. So, so yeah, I'm going to I'm, I'm get to my, ahead, official, my, my official question is, is about this micro factory. I mean, give us a sense. Um, I mean, you're, you're familiar with assembly plants. I mean, um, you know, 250,000 units a year and, and, you know, huge capacity, lots of people. Um, what is it that you guys are doing now? Now you're building one in Charlotte, North Carolina right now, I understand. Yeah. So we've announced three. Um, the first bus microfactory is actually in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Then the first van microfactory is in Bister in the UK. And then to your point, we've also announced a van microfactory here in the US in Charlotte. Um, so to your point, Gary, when you look at the traditional vehicle assembly plant, as you say, it's a very large purpose-built facility. The investment to build one and commission one is hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And when you spend that much capital in order to amortize that much capital, you've got to build hundreds of thousands of vehicles in that micro factory. And so, um, again, the, the high capital intensity really drives a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the business constraints in the traditional industry. What we've developed is what we call a micro factory approach. Um, it's very different for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we, selected a set of processes and developed materials such that we can deploy our micro factories inside of a building that was built to be a warehouse. And here are some shots inside of um, one of our prototype uh, manufacturing cells in the UK. Uh, that building it's positioned in is just a warehouse that uh, we then installed equipment in. This gives us great flexibility in where we site the micro factories. These uh, little wheeled robots I'll talk about a bit in a minute as well. But um, the other thing about the micro factory is it takes us 40 to $50 million to equip one and stand one up. And we can do it in about six months after the warehouse is ready for installation of equipment. And so from a business plan standpoint, especially today with the industry in this huge transition from ICE vehicles to electric vehicles, the ability to deploy additional manufacturing capacity at 40 in 40 or $50 million chunks instead of 100 million or billions of dollars um, is a real advantage. And the micro factories, the van micro factory will, is capacitized for 10,000 vehicles on two shifts. The bus micro factory is 1,000 buses per year on two shifts. So. Again, from a business case or a business plan standpoint, we don't have to commit these huge sums of capital and then take several years building the plant and then hope that the demand materializes uh, in order to buy all the vehicles out of the plant. We can, on the other hand, honestly be in commercial negotiations with large, the, one of the large fleet operators. And when we feel like we're pretty close to uh, getting volumes locked in, start deploying micro factories to fulfill that uh, that capacity. Um, the micro factories are very different inside. Uh, we don't use sheet metal stampings in the micro factory. All of our panels are uh, proprietary composite material. And that's important because it uses a low pressure process and it uses in mold color. So if you're familiar with a traditional assembly plant, we don't need a press shop and we don't need a paint shop. And you know, our analogy to the body shop doesn't use any welding. It uses adhesives and mechanical fasteners. And then um, throughout the whole micro factory, um, as you all well know, a traditional assembly plant is built around an assembly line, which is essentially a serial process. Every vehicle goes through the same stations in the same order at the same speed, day after day, week after week. When I referenced software earlier, and uh, on the videos that were on the screen, you saw these little wheeled robots rolling around. We use those robots, which we've developed uh, in arrival. We use those robots to carry parts as well as carry vehicles. And they don't follow a prescribed path. The cells are set up, the manufacturing cells are set up, and then the software controls what order the mobile robots go to which cells and which parts get delivered to which cells. So it basically gives us an infinitely flexible um, way to link the cells together, which gives us a lot of flexibility 
in uh, maximizing the utilization of all the machinery as well as flexibility in what we build in the micro factory. Mike, is this a, I mean, is this a concept or an, or an approach that would allow you, I mean, let's say you have a customer who says, I don't know, I need 5,000 vans in California that you could basically set up a shop, you know, somewhere within 200 miles of that person's depot and build the vans and then knock it down and take it somewhere else to for a similar, is that the kind of flexibility you're talking about? Or it's Absolutely. We, we could do that, Joe. The other thing that really intrigues me is the, um, the ability to design for specific customers to your point, or even for specific regions or countries, you know, as, as the automotive industry has globalized, um, we've always searched for the perfect answer for the world car, right? Something that we can make in one type somewhere in the world and sell all over the world. At Arrival, we don't have to make that choice. We can have different micro factories in different regions producing different vehicles, um, either driven by customer requirements or by um, just unique requirements of the region that we're situated in. So I, I think there are a lot of advantages to this micro factory approach. When, when you look at um, replacement parts, you know, like sometimes people crash into a UPS truck. How does the, how does the micro factory uh, approach account for that? I mean, are you, you know, building up parts inventory in a centralized location and you can distribute it anywhere or does it kind of stay specific to whatever factory the original truck came out of? So um, there are a couple of ways I'd answer that, Mike. Uh, one is first, I mentioned this composite material um, that we've developed in house. It's a very, uh, tough composite. If you go on YouTube and search for uh, some of the videos you we posted there, you'll see some of our folks um, beating on these panels with hammers um, and not uh, not causing them any damage. So obviously, to our fleet customers, this is a huge advantage that uh, uh, the typical cosmetic damage that they have to repair doesn't occur with these composite panels. As I said earlier. They're also in mold color, which means that the color is throughout the panel. If you scratch one of these panels, you don't reveal a different color underneath. It's the same color throughout. But to get back to your question uh, specifically on spare parts, because our tooling costs are so low for these panels, um, we actually are looking at whether we want to set up little specific spare parts composite panel uh, manufacturing locations that just do um, spare parts and aftermarket parts. The, um, the metal structure of the vehicles is aluminum, it's extrusions and casting. So again, we stay away from stampings to the extent possible. Um, so even there, the tooling cost for uh, running additional extrusions is, uh, is very low. So Mike, when are we going to see arrival vehicles rolling around here in the U.S.? So the bus micro factory that I mentioned earlier that is in Rock Hill, South Carolina will begin production by the end of this year. And again, I, I'd uh, encourage your listeners to go onto YouTube and, and look up the arrival videos. There's some great videos showing you the bus um, to the points I made earlier. It's a very different bus from uh, uh, today's buses. It, it'll have a very different experience riding it. So again, that's in production by the end of the year. And then uh, the van, here, production starts in the UK by Q3 of next year. And the Charlotte Microfactory here in the US will be in production with vans not long after that. So by the end of next year, you'll certainly see both rival buses and vans rolling around on streets in the US. That's great. Well, I think we have to wrap it up then. You gave us uh, 30 minutes of your time and we're most appreciative that you did. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, what you guys are doing both from the product point of view and certainly the process point of view. I mean, this, this micro factory has been talked about a lot, but you know, you guys are apparently delivering on that. So, um, Mike Abelson, we want to thank you very much for spending some time with us today. My pleasure talking to you guys. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. All right. And so we're going to take a quick break and we're going to get a message from our sponsor Bridgestone. Well, that was pretty fascinating. Yes, it was. It is. 
Yeah, very different. What'd you think, Mike? Yeah, I mean, we've. Uh, I, I was on a previous episode where we talked about micro factories a few years ago. It's like mm-hmm. it's the prom. It's the eternal promise of, you know, the whoever can make something in ten thousand units profitably wins. Usually, we talk about the consumer wise, but still, it's uh, it's fascinating to think that you could, you know, build something. And even the other piece too, you know, he's talking about. Is you're not um, if you're building it in a warehouse, you're not leaving behind this you know hollow shell if your business goes south or you move the factory. Yeah, right. no, I think that yeah, I, I and I was really interested in, that you know the, in the idea that these factories can move around to, to be proximate to a, a big order or a big customer, and and right, Mike, like you said, you don't have to leave behind some massive monument to failure, right? That like unfortunately <laughs> we see. You know, it's just a it's just a warehouse, and Amazon can come in and use it, and it's all good. And yeah, it, I mean, I just thought it was, it's fascinating because the 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 idea that basically the battery is the battery; it costs what it costs. It has a market price, and you, you the OEM, can't change that. So you've got to work on everything around that. Um, I think that's a really important insight that Arrival has 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 honed in on, and I think you're seeing that other companies too. But I I think that's an interesting insight for the whole electric vehicle industry. Um, you have to optimize everything around the battery because the battery kind of sits there as, as a certain market price that isn't going to really be different. So, you know, one of the things that I wonder about in, in this context, and Joe, you were, you were mentioning it earlier that, I mean, you have um, Amazon, you know, invested in Rivian and is getting a big order of trucks from Rivian. Um, you know, General Motors has started that um, bright drop division. Right. Um, and its first customer was FedEx. Um, and you know, the, the question I have is, is the commercial space, the one where EVs will have the biggest impact rather than amongst people like us? Uh, you know, I, I think it's going to have an, an equivalent impact. And I think it's going to be really important for the comp- the different companies, um, especially as they all seek environmental credits, right? I mean, so Tesla has sort of the retail luxury electric vehicle status, electric vehicle market pretty well sewed up for the time being. I mean, obviously the other companies have something to say about that and we'll find out how that works. But this commercial space is a lot more, you know, rationally driven. It's not emotional. You know, there aren't fanboys at UPS, right? <laughs> they're, they're fans of, can you get, can you, can you solve my ESG and emissions problem? And do it at a lower cost of operation. I mean, like Mike said, at a lower cost of operation. And so that's going to be interesting to see how that market evolves and 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 who winds up being the winners as that shakes out. Yeah, I was I was just going to say pretty much the same thing. Is it's it's cut and dry with these companies because they know their use case, they know how much they're going to save, and if they if they're paying for something that costs more up front but the running costs are low, they know when it's going to pay off. So it's it's as long you know assuming everything works as it plans, which is why they make these small bets and do these small trial fleets. But after that, then it, it's cut and dry. And so to me, that means that the, the fleet companies are going to lead, you know, move forward. And I think to some degree, that's going to normalize EVs to the consumer. But I, I don't know if the two are really that linked in terms of buying behavior. Well, but I, but Mike, I, I, I think I can, I can get on board with that because I think the more you see a UPS truck that's, that's that, or a FedEx or an Amazon vehicle that's electric, I mean, we see people. Most people see those vehicles every day. I certainly do where I live. And if those become electric and become normal, and you sit, you say, "Well, there it is again." There's that electric Amazon truck or that electric, you know, that arrival UPS truck didn't break down, <laughs> didn't didn't stop by the side of the road. It's right here, <laughs> you know. Um, they, they, you know, the, the guy, the, the man or woman in the brown uniform trusts it. Um, I think it. I think it definitely helps. With that, I'm not sure how transfer. I mean, it's probably more of an issue for General Motors, right, or Ford to get that to transfer to a consumer product. Um, but um, I think it's something that that helps that that cause, if that's the cause you have. You know, Joe, you, you were you were mentioning, um, you know, the idea that that he had that batteries are batteries; they have a price. Deal with it. Um, this week, Ford announced that they're going to be developing the Ford Ion Park for um, battery development. Um, They have a battery benchmarking and test facility in Allen Park, Michigan. Now they're gonna be adding another, what was it, a $185 million facility. Um, It'll be a 200,000 square foot operation for 
the development of batteries and the the development of the processes to make batteries. Um, right. So, is it is it uncom- incumbent upon companies like Ford to have this this battery um, capability, or should this just be dealt with by suppliers? So, I, I what I would say is that Ford and and GM and Tesla, GM and Tesla certainly, um, and I think Ford is following suit. They've concluded that they've got to be. They've got to be. They've got to have control of their own technology and their own production system. I mean, not necessarily 100% control. I mean, General Motors has joint ventures with uh, LG Chem to to pr- sort of co-produce the battery technology that they believe is superior or, or is most competitive, and to have control right of that production and the costs around it. Um, yeah, it does seem like there's a, a rethink going on, and, and Ford. Ford's kind of doing it in real time in public. The rethink you can you can you can listen to Jim Farley thinking about it aloud as he talks about this issue and how Titan. Um, yeah, I think there's a belief that that you know we these companies have got to really understand this technology and just buying whatever they're offered off the shelf is is going to leave them in a bad in a bad place. Um, you know, I just that that seems to be worth the investment to Ford. Well, if you look to it like, um, you know, airbags is one example, or right now the chip shortage, you know, it's that something happens with the market or a uh, an item on the car that has been reduced to two or three suppliers. When, you know, if one of them goes down or one of them has a problem, that has huge ripples. And so, again, you're, if you're looking at the chip shortage now, you're going to look at that and go, we don't want that to happen to batteries. If <laughs> No, that's absolutely right, and I think that, in fact, that's, I think that's directly right. I think they're absolutely thinking that. Um, I was on a conference call with Hao Tai Tang of Ford, and he pretty much said, "Mike, what you just said, that they've got to have, they've got to really control the critical things in their supply chain, and just hoping that uh, stuff shows up at the factory gate, and uh, you know, how it does, how that happens, isn't my problem. That's that's been blown out of the water by the last year." But isn't it interesting that that these companies now seem to be going back to vertical integration, which was which was thought to be, you know, bad. it is. Well, yeah, it's back to the future, right? I mean, it's 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 you know, it's the it's the rouge. It's 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 it's, it's <laughs> vertical. It's vertical integration. It's body on frame, except now we call it a, a skateboard. But uh, it's the same kind of idea. Is you have a you have a common frame that you can bolt whatever the heck you want on top of, and uh, off you go. I mean, it's just interesting to watch that evolution. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, I think it's vertical integration. I mean, not the way Henry Ford did it, more sophisticated and fluid than that. But it does seem like, yeah, that's what's happening. Uh, b- these companies want to know what what's it going in the going in the cars and the vehicles. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's the, there's the potential there too, right? You know, the other side could just say, all right, yeah, these are a commodity. Ford making their own batteries or or making their own controllers is is not worth the amount of gain they get, but. There is the potential where it could make a difference. Um, you know, like Sandy Monroe was mentioning, uh, this is old now, but from on this show about how you know Tesla has the the best control system for their batteries, and it, you know maybe that's the next thing of uh, like a GM versus Ford powertrain is well, you know, no Ford's got the better batteries, or you know, well, the big pack is good in the GM, but the small ones. You know, right. or, the, or, the, or or they call it the GM would call it the small pack, right? Yeah, <laughs> the small pack that's actually big. Never mind. Yeah. Um, no, but that's right. And and I, I, yeah, I I I agree. And I, and I think the stuff that Sandy Monroe's been talking about um, with, with Tesla. I mean, he's it's amazing to watch his his evolution on Tesla. He started out as a real skeptic, um, but. But he's got, you know, this is what he does, right? He digs way deep into the technology and he makes a convincing case that the design of your magnet in an electric car is, is a competitive differentiator. You know, just any old magnet isn't really what you want. You have, anyway, he, he, you can look at his videos, but I, I think that's what you're seeing. You know, one of the things I wonder about is, is that, so, okay, Ford makes this announcement, what was it, Monday or Tuesday, and then the following day, General Motors announces Altium Charge 360. And I'm, I'm like looking at this information for Altium Charge 360. And maybe, Joe, you could explain it to me, but it just seems to me that they're basically saying, um, yeah, we, we've signed some deals with, with more um, charging outlets and, oh, there's an app for your phone. I mean, 
is is this is this all about one upsmanship and you know we're still waiting for the deliverable uh, a little bit yeah i think i mean look again i, mean, I think it's back to the future it's it's horsepower wars except you know in another in another in another way I, I think with the gm thing though and i and i to be honest i sort of said oh whatever you know charging network and then i looked at it again i have to be honest i said okay wait a minute they now have they now can t can give their electric vehicle buyers most of whom are going to be happening in the future, right? I mean, there's the, the big volume's coming in a couple of years. But they're going to be able to say to their electric vehicle buyers, you can stop any at any one of 60,000 places and get these things charged up, which is, you know, I think three times, I'm depending on how they're counted, but it's it's a big network. It's rivals Tesla or is bigger than Tesla's now, at least on the numbers, the headline numbers. So I think that's important to be able to say you can stop you know, sixty thousand places. You're never. You're not going to be that far from a charge. So buy with confidence. That's clearly what they're up to. But but if you have a credit card, can't you stop at most of those places anyway? Yeah, but it, yeah, I think that's where it's headed. But I don't think it's. I mean, maybe Mike knows better than me. But my understanding is that even today, those different charging networks are still fairly fragmented, and you need you know you need to be in the club. You have a special card. It's not quite at the sort of the gas station level of transparency yet. And, I, and it seems to me that's what GM is trying for, is that like you can just stop anywhere. It's not a big deal kind of a proposition. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the frustrations some people that have reviewed some of the recent EVs have said is you, you have to go to these chargers and you have to have an account. So you can't right. you just show up with your credit card. And like, you know, once you have the account, it's fine. But it's not quite as simple as the gas station. Um, you know, my, my other take on the GM thing is, is all of the traditional OEMs are desperate for, you know, the fawning stock approval that the tech giants get. So, you know, like, yeah, we got to put out, so they had news. We got to have news. We got to make sure that people aren't selling us because someone else had good news. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's, yes, yes. So there's a lot of marketing here and I, and I, you know, I'm confident that it drives it drives people at GM and Ford nuts that Elon Musk tweets something about some minor feature you know, in the dashboard of the of the Model Y, and he gets all this buzz and mojo um, for what? You know, for something that they, you know, it's a Guga. So yeah, I think that's a lot of it. So so I mean, to that point, um, I mean, what do you guys think the the real chances are for startup companies that aren't Tesla? Okay, let's put put them somewhere else. Um, you know, in terms of reaching consumers as we're going to be seeing Ford and General Motors um, a few weeks ago you know we had a guy from Audi on talking about you know their their whole range of electric vehicles I mean that you know if you want the person if you want the consumer to be comfortable you know consumers probably going to be pretty comfortable with a Chevy and not so comfortable with a brand they've never heard of I mean do the, the big ones automatically win Mike, why don't you go first? Um, I, I was, I mean, I'm, I'm eternally an optimist when it comes to things like bespoke, uh, weird stuff that the market usually doesn't support. So if there's a, if there's an argument that will, that will say we're gonna have that kind of stuff, I'll go with it. But I, I would say, um, I think there's a, a chance for the startups, and maybe it is always sort of playing in the small pool. Like if you think of craft beer versus, you know, the huge volume of the of the beer giants, and and I, and I would say that, um, you know, a couple pieces of that. Tesla has really done, Tesla has done a lot in terms of, you know, challenging the traditional dealer model, but also, you know, let's be honest, changing what consumers expect of a car. That like every, everyone in traditional automotive journalism and even a lot of consumers are like, I wouldn't buy this because of some of the quality issues. And Tesla has, it so far has not stopped Tesla. So if you have, you're going to have, you know, general commodification or to some degree where, you know, you could license a platform or you could build a skateboard platform cheaper than you could build, you know, a full body in white as a startup. And then, um, you know, if, if you have a couple of niggling things here or there, but you're building a niche car, people will probably tolerate that more than they used to. So I, you know, I don't think it's going to be, you know, everything, the whole market is, is niche startups, but I think there's space for them. Yeah, I, so I, I agree with I agree with that, and and with what Mike said, um, I'd add this. I mean, I think you're seeing a live action experiment of this in China, where you have several uh, electric vehicle startups, Neo and and others that are kind of out of the gate and and selling vehicles. Um, now, not all of them are success are successful. I think several of them are struggling, 
And I do think that these markets tend to shake out. Um, you know, the, the, there's a certain structure to the automotive industry in any segment. Um, you know, there's number one, there's number two, and then you take the escalator down, you know, to, to uh, the, the sub-basement for numbers three through six. And I think that's probably going to happen in this market. Um, it, 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 I think it's still pretty nascent and, and early days. Uh, but, you know, I think some of these startups will, will make it. Some of them won't. And I do think that the big, the legacy company or the established companies like Ford, GM, Daimler, um, Audi, Volkswagen um, are going to find their place in the electric vehicle market. They're not guaranteed, they're not guaranteed to lose. You know, I think the Mach-E's reception, you know, seems to indicate that Ford is a credible electric vehicle seller if they get the formula right. All right, so let's let's stay with that thought for a minute. Um, we've got to take a quick break um, and hear from our friends with Magnet, and we'll be back with much more. And we're back. Um, so, so sticking with this, um, call them legacy automobile manufacturers. Uh, there are some interesting stats came out this week. Um, Volkswagen said that by 2030, they plan for Volkswagen brand, okay, the VW brand, to have 70 percent, seven zero percent of all of its sales in Europe being electric vehicles by 2030. And they anticipate in North America, it will be 50%, 5 by 2030. Then we heard from Honda, which basically said that um, they anticipate 40% of its sales by 2030 being EVs or fuel cell vehicles. Then it'll ramp up to 80% in 2035 and be 100% in 2040. Now, this 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 seems <laughs> to me to be a rather aggressive uh, flight plan for both of those companies. Yeah, uh, it, it, no, it does. I mean, I've I've thought of a variety of jokes about about all these promises to 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 be you know like Lord make me electric but not yet. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, twenty you know make me electric by twenty forty when the CEO or the board of directors that are currently in place will all be gone and can't be held accountable <laughs> if it fails. I I could go on. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things going on here. One is is a genuine, uh, you know, a sincere, genuine, serious, no baloney business decision that these companies have made. That you know, looking at Tesla and looking at the reception to Tesla and and looking at the at the environment. And I guess I mean it all ways in the environment, political, social, and the in the climate. And saying, you know what, this is what we got to say. This is what we got to do because we'll be. If we act like everything's going to stay the same, and it does you know all the issues that are out there now about internal combustion are going to just go away, we're going to get we could get run over. Now, do I am I absolutely positive that if I'm still around in 2040, there there'll be no internal combustion vehicles being sold by Honda? No, I'm not that I'm not positive of that. It might be messier than that. In certain markets, it'll absolutely be messier than that. Yeah, I mean, it's all kind of surprising when you look at, you know, that's a huge, it's a fast ramp up, right? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what is the total percentage of, Honda doesn't have any EVs in the, well, they have the Clarity, sorry. And, uh, you know, they have a few hybrids, but it's not the bulk of their volume. No. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, 2030, the, the companies that are saying 2030, I mean, that's, that's a business thing they're looking at because, you know, eight years is the sort of time frame where you're planning powertrains. So that's serious, and they're going to do it. Whether or not it's going to hit the volume, I mean, I mean, I think it, it speaks to their confidence in building vehicles at you know whatever cost they can predict, and with a range that people will will find agreeable. But it, it's also, yeah, I mean, forty percent. That's, that's yeah, and, and I think there's, I think look, I also think there's a certain amount of signaling going on here. Um, and and um, my my colleague uh, uh, Nick Carey had a story 
today um, out of Europe where um, the head of, head of Daimler Trucks, Martin Daum, and the head of, of Volvo were talking about their plans to, to field fuel cells for, for heavy commercial trucks. And their basic message, I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, they, Martin Daum said exactly what he meant to say. He said, we can, we can deliver a fuel cell, a viable commercial fuel cell truck. The problem is whether you, and he's addressing European governments, will deliver the, the refueling network that makes those things viable to, to fleet users. And, and he says, if, we, if you don't, this isn't going to work. And so I think when you look at the, cons you know, the electric vehicle promises, I think there's some of the same thing going on where the companies are saying, we will deliver the hardware, but you, government, will have to figure out how to get consumers who are not Tesla fans, right, to buy them and figure out who's paying for the, the, uh, the charging network because, you know, the car companies don't want to build that. I think one of the things to consider too is, you know, if you look, especially 20 years, like with, with Honda's prediction, but even 10 years, if you look back in history, you know, like 1961 to 1980, if in 1961, you've said some of the things that were going on in the market of 1980, you'd be laughed out of the room. And similarly, probably the same from 1980 to 2000. And even on a 10 year scale, there's big shifts, especially if you look at the seventies and in, in OPEC and emissions. So it's, it might sound kind of crazy right now, but you got to remember like things are constantly shifting and, you know, 10 years is a time scale where it, things get a lot different in the automotive market. Yes, things absolutely do change um, rather rapidly. Um, Joe, you were mentioning earlier about the proliferation of startup EV companies in China. Um, and it, it had seemed for a long time that, that um, not for a long time, but for, for a long time in, in EV time um that that tesla was a darling over there they built the factory they were selling like mad and um at the shanghai show there was a young lady who was standing on top of a model three and she was protesting saying that the uh, brakes didn't work um john mcquarry had made a list uh, that he picked up from uh, bloomberg um indicating the many attacks that the chinese government has been making on tesla of late is it possible that we're seeing a turn there in terms of the Chinese government saying, you know what, maybe we need to have our, our homegrown EV companies be successful and in, in not this guy from Silicon Valley? Yeah, I, I, th I do think there's some of it. I mean, look, at the, I mean, so first of all, let's stipulate that I don't know what's going on inside the minds of the people of the, who run the government of China. Uh, I think that's kind of obvious. But, but, but the optics suggest, number one, you're right, that there's a, there, there's a concern about letting Elon Musk and this American company run roughshod over, um, over startups born in China. Um, I think a second thing um, is that I think the Chinese government is, very, is, is usually pretty happy to have foreign companies come and, and play in their, in, in their market, but you've got to play by their rules. And the, the, the behavior that Elon Musk and Tesla uh, exhibit towards regulators in the United States, you know, basically, I mean, almost in so many words, telling the people at the SEC, uh, you know, to do various unnatural things. <laughs> um, you know, you can't get away with that stuff in China. That's not how you roll. And I think that what's happened in here is 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 the Chinese government basically saying, look, you need to play you need to play by our rules. We've let you build a billion dollar factory in Shanghai and they clearly they don't want that to fail, right? That would be self-destructive. But at the same time, it's a reminder that, you know, you have to play by our rules. And, you know, if our customers are mad and, and filling up social media with a bunch of flack, you have to deal with that. You can't just blow them off. And, and you know, same thing, if, if they want to keep you, there is a, even a little bit of remember who's boss. So, you know, if you've got a couple of things that make you an easy target, like quality issues, they're going to use that and mm -hmm. remind you, you know, they own 50% of that factory. Well, right. And also look, I mean, the other thing is that there's, you know, there, there are one or two things bigger than Elon Musk. And one of them is the relationship between China and the United States writ large, right? The sort of the geopolitical relationship, which, you know, Joe Biden was talking about last night. Um, and it, Mike, to your point, this is a very, this is a fine way for the Chinese government to remind you know, American business, who's boss. So, so sticking with a almost all electric show, um, we have a question from um, 
one of our viewers, Stephen Dibb, who is curious on your thoughts of the $59,000 Cadillac Lyric. Um, what do you guys, I mean, obviously none of us have driven it, but I mean, what do you think about it? And, and uh, he makes the point that uh, at that price, the XT6 is no longer a very uh, interesting proposition. Mike? Uh, you know, I, I see it as um, Cadillac gaining coherence. You know, they've, 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 uh, been a, a bit wandering lately you know are they are they building cars are they behind on suvs what does the brand stand for and you know a while back they said we're moving into evs and then you know they show this and it's and, and yeah i think it definitely makes the S xc6 look a little less attractive it's you know here is something that cadillac is using to define themselves it uh, you know it looks good it's got all the technology it's it seems solid to me yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I also think, I mean, look, I, I think we can have a, we can have a, a really, we have a whole nother show about how long it's going to take the mass market in, in, in North America to go electric, you know, absent a massive federal policy change. Um, but I think the debate's over in the luxury segments. I think luxury segments uh, are going electric really fast. And, um, and so, yeah, I think Cadillac bringing the, the Lyric and, you know, I think the, I'm not sure I'm right about this, but I, th I think Steve Carlisle's view would probably be, you know what, if the Lyric starts out selling the XT6, there you go. That's the way the market's headed. And wait till you see the electric Escalade, you know? <laughs> so right. I think that's probably what the view is there. Well, it, it seems that Cadillac has basically indicated that by the end of like all going forward, the new introductions will all be electric vehicles. And so it, it you know, the, the luxury space becomes electric. Um, you know, but the thing I wonder about is, is that do consumers really care what's under the hood of their vehicles? I mean, outside of the enthusiast group, do they, do they really care? Could you weld that thing shut and, and uh, it, whether you're putting in electrons or liquids, it doesn't matter. I don't think we're there yet. I think ultimately that's right. When you get total sort of performance and range and kind of maintenance cost parity amongst the different powertrains. But I think for a lot of people right now, it does kind of matter. Maybe not everybody. Well, not maybe, certainly not everybody, but for a lot of people, I think it does matter. Yeah. I mean, I think from a, from a standpoint of like, I know what kind of engine I have, or I want a turbo or I want a four cylinder or a three cylinder. I'd say less and less, but it, it comes back to there's it, it comes back to the old habits of of consumers, you know, range anxiety with a car, or you know, they heard someone had a problem at a fast charge station, and so they don't want that's going to hold them back for a few years, or you know, th this transmission or this kind of engine is unreliable, and so they're not going to get that. Um, but I think you know, by and large, not a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I think it's going to take a while for everybody to get comf comfortable switching to an electric vehicle. But if, depending on your sort of what you do, I mean, you know, I think if you're just sort of commuting, you know, under under 100 miles a day, right? You know, you're not driving, you know, across the state and back every every day. Uh, you're right. The difference between an electric vehicle and a four cylinder compact, you know, SUV or something like that is is it's immaterial. Um, if you're towing a big Airstream trailer, you might not be ready to get out of your V8 Chevy or Ford F-250 just yet, you know? So I think it's kind of depends on who you are and what you're doing. Well, I mean, but, but, you know, that sort of a use case would say like lend itself to a diesel, right? I mean, that would be mm -hmm. the great application for that, for that kind of a powertrain. But it, it just seems to me that by and large, if you were to say to people, you know what, you come home from work, just like your cell phone, you plug it in and you know, the next day you're good to go. And um, I, I think that there would be very little, little resistance to that. Um, I think there are lots of people who look at these as means of transportation, full stop. Yeah, no, I, I well, yeah, go ahead, Mike. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I, say, yeah, I think the resistance is, is just the idea of, you know, people have a built in idea of like, I'm, you know, you can take the gas engine from my cold dead hands kind of thing where it's it like, but the actual usage <laughs> is, yeah, once you get used to it, you don't, you know, a lot of people have an idea that may or may not jive with reality. And it, and it, again, it really comes down to how are you using it, not not knowing or thinking or caring about how the car is powered. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, you know, I, if I knew it was going to happen in five years, I would immediately leave this show and go make a million dollars, <laughs> a billion dollars. But I guess what I would expect, you know, is that, you know, three to five over the next three to five years, you're going to see a lot more 
dual households where car number car number one is an electric vehicle, car number two or is, is actually SUV number two or maybe pickup number two, with a with an, an internal combustion powertrain that they take you take on vacation or you haul the toy trailer or whatever, and you know I, that seems pretty plausible to me. That sort of you know one one and one in a lot of driveways and garages. Okay, so I promised that this was gonna be an hour long show. I see it, we're at the top of the hour. So I wanna thank you both for being on the show today. Joe White, Reuters, Mike Austin, Hemmings. Appreciate it very much. I mean, uh, could, couldn't have done the arrival thing without you. So I, I, I really do appreciate it. So thank you. No, thanks Glad Gary, great to, Mike. Yeah, great to be on, be okay, well. So John will be back next you. week, so thank you. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.